Thank you for joining us on this edition of the news on Equinox Television from our headquarters in Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. I am Babla Jonathan. In our top stories in this edition of the news, ex pro independence fighters at the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration center in the southwest regional chief town Boya go on a rampage. They went protesting today over poor living conditions in the center in which they have been living for quite some time now since they dropped their guns and came out of the bushes responding to the call of the head of state president paul b and other government authorities will bring to you details about that in this edition of the news one person dies in an explosion in cameroon's economic capital the victim died after the detonation of an explosive a locally made explosive device in bepanda in the Duala 5 neighborhood and also in this newscast we'll talk about the intermediate lines of Cameroon who are already in Limbe and the Fako Division Southwest region of the country ahead of their semi-final game against Morocco in the ongoing African Nations Championship. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. We begin this newscast in the southwest regional chief town, Boya, where ex separatist fighters had the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration center in that town went on a rampage today and they were protesting over poor living conditions in that center. They blocked the road around the Bokwango neighborhood in the town of Boya. Protest or what they consider as poor living conditions and government's failure to respect the promises. They made promises to give them jobs and, of course, some administrative authorities were on the side, notably the Secretary General of the Southwest, at uh, the Southwest Governor's Office and the Divisional Officer of Boya, who went to talk to the ex-separatist fighters in the town of Boya, Southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon and they responded to them saying I quote we want a solution we want a solution to our plight and the former separatist fighters living in the disarmament demobilization and reintegration center DDR in Boya southwest a region of the country have been uh, protesting since the early part of uh, the day and they have decried the living conditions in the center and have also called on authorities to give them the jobs they promised to give them when they dropped their guns and came out of the bushes and they were received in the disarmament center in the town of Boya. We'll be bringing to you updates on these in our subsequent news editions. Time for us to go over to the northwest region of the country, and we're going to listen to the Archbishop of Bamenda in the south northwest region of the country. Of course, Bishop Andrew Nkia will be talking about the sufferings of the people as far as the Anglophone crisis is concerned. He was speaking over the weekend. Take a listen to this extract selected and sent to us by a Northwest correspondent, Mbustela. Your Eminence, you have come to visit us at a time when the people of this ecclesiastical province, corresponding to the civil territorial circumscription of the Northwest and Southwest regions of Cameroon, have seen a lot of suffering. Many of our people have suffered a lot from a situation they did not create. And thousands are either internally displaced or have escaped as refugees. Businesses are shut down. And for about four years, our children were not allowed to go to school. Children were used as a bait for political motives and struggle. Many priests, religious, bishops and lay people of this province have either been beaten, harassed, or even killed in this conflict. And yet, the church continues to carry the gospel message as the light of hope 
to a traumatized people. Your Eminence, today your feet, today that your feet are standing on the soil of Bamenda that has drunk the blood of many of our children, we in Bamenda can address ourselves in the messianic words of the prophet Isaiah, a people that walked in darkness has seen a great light. The Bishop of Bamenda, his grace, Andrew Kia, who is the Archbishop of Bamenda, speaking there in the presence of the envoy of the Pope Francis, the envoy of the Vatican, his um, eminence Pietro Parolin, who was in the town of Bamenda on an official visit, and he said that dialogue is the only way out of the current conflict and that arms should be dropped. These are some of the uh, issues highlighted by the envoy of the Vatican during his visit to Bamenda. And books tell us in greater details from Bamenda. Name of Pope Francis, Bishop of Rome, and of the Holy Roman Church for the honor of the Church of Bamenda and as a symbol of your authority as Metropolitan Archbishop, we confer on you the pallium. His Grace Andrew Fuanyankea receiving the pallium, which is a symbol of full episcopal authority from His Eminence Pietro Parolin, Secretary of State at the Vatican. His Eminence Pietro Parolin is visiting Bamenda at a time when the conflict in the northwest and southwest region is entering its fifth year and characterized by killings, kidnappings, ghost towns and lockdowns. In his 17-minute sermon, the Cardinal Secretary of State dwelt more on the responsibility of everyone in achieving peace. Dear brothers and sisters, in the difficult situation in which you find yourself living, you are experiencing up close the power of evil that acts in the world. Unfortunately, there is much news of violence, division, and fratricidal struggles that afflict this beloved land. Today's Gospel teaches us not to fear evil, and to trust in him who knows how to conquer it. We are all responsible for peace. We are all responsible for peace. All the actors of society are responsible, from the smallest to the biggest person, that finally arms may be put down, and the peace and reconciliation may reign within us, and around us. Violence never solves problems. It only creates more problems. Peace is a journey of hope, dialogue and reconciliation. Dialogue, therefore, is the best way to solve conflicts and misunderstanding. The mass in Bamenda was attended, among others, by the Minister of State, Secretary General of the Presidency of the Republic, Ferdinand Gongo, a host of government ministers, Cardinal Christian Tumi, bishops and parishioners of the Archdiocese of Bamenda. Stella Mbou reporting there from Bamenda until something else now. An explosion has killed one person here in Cameroon's economic capital, Douala. The victim died after the detonation of the locally made explosive device in Bepanda in the Douala 5 municipality. Mark Fogo reports. <laughs> Amateur video footage showing two persons being transported to the Douala General Hospital after incurring third degree burns. A loud noise was heard in this compound located at Kwaru's Bipanda in the Douala 5 subdivision. After hearing the loud noise, neighbors mobilized themselves in order to save the victims. The arrival of law enforcement officers on the scene facilitated the detection of an improvised explosive device. It is in this room that the incident occurred. Almost everything got burnt. 
dozens of batteries, cartridges and gunpowder were discovered in the room. According to Nebos, the two young men came from the northwest region a few months ago. The explosion has left inhabitants of Bipanda gripped by fear. I was having siesta when I heard a loud noise, so I rushed outside and I saw smoke coming out from that room. I later saw a man equally coming out and he killed severe burns. We had to break the door in order to save the others. I had to sleep somewhere else because the compound was sealed. Even my kids were unable to go to school. Everybody ran helter-skelter after hearing the explosion. There is no security in Cameroon. We are scared that what is happening in the northwest and southwest regions gets here. If I had somewhere else to sleep, I would have left this place. We thought it was a gas port to that exploded. We are not secured. According to reports, one of the victims, who is a student of the Faculty of Economic Sciences of the University of Douala, revealed that the explosion occurred after he ignited his cooking gas to prepare breakfast. But investigators say he lied, given that he could not have ignited the gas before peeling the potatoes he claimed he wanted to fry. The two who hail from Bali Combat are suspected to have been fabricating a bomb when it exploded. Dozens of persons have been arrested after the explosion for investigation purposes. Meantime, the neighborhood is highly militarized. According to hospital authorities, one of the injured victims later gave up the ghost. The death toll of the accident at La Falaise in Chang in the west region of the Republic of Cameroon has risen to at least 55 and 53 persons died on the spot after a head-on collision between a 70-seater bus and a truck transporting fuel. And the Minister of Transport has attributed the accident to illegal or clandestine transportation. He says his ministry has gone to war against that illegal activity. The minister and members of the Parliamentary Network for Road Safety were on the side of the accident. Over the weekend, for me, Armstrong Sander reports. Following an accident that saw 53 Cameroonians dead at La Falaise in Chang, Menua Division of the West Region of Cameroon, Members of the Parliamentary Road Safety Network descended to the scene to see things for themselves, sympathize with victims, and strategize on how to better handle their road safety sensitization mission. It was with very deep shock that uh, we parliamentarians received the terrible news of the death of over 50 Cameroonians at uh, the place called La Falaise de Nchang. Knowing that words alone cannot do justice to the memory of the dead and to the anguish of their families, the Speaker of the National Assembly, the Right Honorable Kavayege Jibril, commissioned us members of the Parliamentary Network for Good Safety to come here today and pay homage to our brothers and sisters who are gone and as well to transmit a message to the survivors. Shocked by the unfortunate incident, the Parliamentary Network promised to intensify sensitization as a means to avoid further accident with focus on road users. Try to reduce uh, accident in our road. Sensibilize. Sensibilize um, uh, the drivers. Sensibilize uh, the government. Sensibilize um, uh, every person. Because uh, it's not um, a problem of one person. You know that there is a list of transport. Not his own problem, but it's the problem concerns all people, and we need to work together to try to uh, uh, solve the problem. Yes. The people's representatives frowned at the irresponsible behavior of some drivers and say the accident should be a wake up call to all Cameroonians. It's a call on all of us Cameroonians to adopt safe behaviors 
on the roads. So that this circle of recklessness, which is occasioned so many deaths, will stop. Also present was the Minister of Transport, Jean-Ernest Masinangale Bibe, who announced that his ministry has launched a war against clandestine transportation and the transportation of dangerous products in Cameroon. Jean-Ernest Masinangale Bibe says his ministry, in collaboration with partners like the Parliamentary Road Safety Network, will get rid of the phenomenon of the transportation of dangerous products in Cameroon, which is unfortunately coming back after five years. The decision of the Minister of Transport to ban night journeys has been criticized by opposition politicians in the country. They think that accidents on highways across the country are caused to a greater extent by what they consider as the irresponsible attitude of the government and corrupt state agents at control opposed and poor road maintenance policy in the Republic of of Cameroon. In the meantime, the opposition or politicians of the ruling Cameroon People's Democratic Movement, CPD and political party, think that the bulk of the responsibility as far as road accidents in the country is concerned is on the shoulders of drivers who are said to be very irresponsible, violating highway codes and also other issues highlighted by the politicians in the course of the weekly program on Equinox Television, draw the response. Innocent as has more. The Chang Lafales accident that claimed over 53 lives recently gave birth to differing opinions with others suggesting night journeys be banned on the Douala Bavosam Road so as to curb such accidents in future. This has sparked off debate in the political college. SDF's barrister Lavoisier Sapi holds that the problem does not stem from night or day journeys, but from whether the government does its assignments properly. The Minister of Transport, he says, cannot violate existing law authorizing night journeys. Rather there is need to reflect on real causes of the road accidents. Sur les causes réelles des accidents. Vous avez indexé le ministre Ngale Bibé. Maintenant, Maritain Zang, militant of the Civilian Party, kicks back the blame on government authorities into the opposition's camp. Vous avez dîné avec l'État? He blames inter-urban transporters for overloading, picking up and dropping off passengers on the way, thereby putting lives of passengers in jeopardy. He asks, what happened in Chang was an accident which occurred naturally like others. Thus, the state should not be implicated. Mais vous prenez seulement ce cas, mais vous ne dites pas combien de voyages ont été satisfaits sur la même route. A CBDM defense which does not make sense to the CRM and allies. Government authorities, according to Pierre Emmanuel Binyam, are primarily responsible for all the scandals on the national roads. Poor state of rules, corruption by the regime's agents at control posts, and many others account for frequent road accidents in Cameroon and never night journeys. The minister said pertinently. Traveling at night, he says, is already a culture and way of life of the populations of the Northwest, Southwest and West regions. He questions if the Minister of Transport would have made a similar statement if the accident involved a lorry in the place of the 70-seater bus. Meantime, the opposition suggests the Minister of Transport initiates an independent fact-finding commission to probe into all accidents in the country for justice to take its course. 
things in Osenazi. Now in sports, the intermediate lines of Cameroon are already in Limbe in Faculty Division Southwest Region of the Republic of Cameroon ahead of the uh, semi-final clash against Morocco. Uh, that will be uh, coming up and the team arrived uh, the hotel, the players arrived their hotel uh, amid tight security in Limbe, in the southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon. Cameroon qualified for the semi-finals after beating the Democratic Republic of Congo two goals to one. The four teams still taking part in the African Nations Championship, Shan Cameroon 2020, are having a 48 hour rest after the qualification to the semi finals of the tournament. Magic and Gabriel now brings to us some vital statistics after the quarter final games played over the weekend. His report. Smart Njikan Gabriel with some vital, vital statistics on the unfolding of the 2020 African Nations Championship ongoing in the Republic of Cameroon. And of course, the quarterfinal uh, games were played at the weekend, and the intermediate lines of Cameroon uh, qualified after beating the Democratic Republic of Congo two goals uh, to one, while Morocco uh, also qualified for the quarterfinal games. These are the two uh, themes that will be uh, locking hands at the uh, semi-finals in Limbe, in the southwest region of the Republic of Cameroon's Magic. And Gabriel now presents to us some vital statistics on the competition going on in Cameroon. It is all ended at the Bepanda Omnisport Stadium. Morocco is the next opponent for the Intermediate Lions of Cameroon. Morocco this evening at the Bepanda Omnisport Stadium defeated their opponent Zambia by three goals to one. Morocco started the competition timidly with a 1-0 victory, a draw, and finally beating their opponents on the last playing day by five goals to two. Morocco is now set to confront the Intermediate Lions at the level of the semi-finals, and it should be recalled when the Moroccan team entered Cameroon, they said they were coming here for a defense of their title, the one in 2018. And their opponents next in the course of this competition will be none other than the intermediate lion that defeated the Democratic Republic of Congo at the Japoma Sports Stadium on Saturday by two goals to one. Already, we know that Mali qualified on Saturday, beating their opponents of the day, Congo, after post-match penalty shootout by five goals to two. Mali will be waiting for their opponents at the level of the semi-finals as Guinea will take on Rwanda. The one semi-final ticket that is sure and one of the fixtures that is sure will be at the Ngeme Stadium on Wednesday when Cameroon Intermediate Lions will be taking on the Atlas Lions of Morocco. Morocco should be recalled. They recorded the highest number of goals at the group stage and they recorded this far the highest number of goals scored in a quarter-final encounter at the African Nations Championship. At the Bepanda Omni Sports Stadium for the Equinox Television News. Raul Tabufwe, Smart, Njikan Gabriel. Thanks, Smart, Njikan Gabriel. And the semi finals of the competition uh, will be coming up on Wednesday in Limbe, Cameroon, will lock hands with Morocco, while Guinea will clash against Mali here in Douala. Coming up next, Talking Point. Thank you for staying with us in Talking Points. Today we are receiving a civil society leader, a development expert, chairman of Excellence Union International Group, Lucas Musoke Lionga. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I'm once more very happy to be at Equinox Television, which is one of the leading television stations in Cameroon, and uh, we all love Equinox, and I think that's why I I'm happy to be here. Right, we we'll begin in the Boya, southwest region of the country, where ex-fighters, uh, the disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration center went on rampage today, protesting against poor living conditions. What's your take on this? Uh, it's a bit difficult to comment, but I think that the people who are concerned have uh, not been able to be satisfied, and I think 
due to their dissatisfaction, that is the reason why they came out publicly to express their dissatisfaction. So it's their right, and I think that if they were brought into a camp, it is so much so that they should be taken care of and properly taken care of. So if the conditions are not the best, then the government needs to investigate, check why the conditions are not the best. Is the government doing what it's supposed to do? Or it is some corrupt officials that are probably not doing what they're supposed to do. So I think that there's need to check what actually went wrong, what is wrong, and where these things are wrong. Because at times, we might not be able to know actually what is the problem. So I think it's now that the government needs to check, verify, and follow up to see that these people have a better living condition because they have left uh, 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 their arms and they prefer to come and be rehabilitated. So I think that it's time to 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 do something better for these uh, Cameroonians. They are also saying that the jobs that they were promised by government authorities are not forthcoming. Yes, I think that the issue of jobs, as we all know, is not very easy. So I think that if the government has promised them jobs, they should be a little bit patient, because one of the problems with Cameroonians is that Cameroonians are not patient. They always like to get things uh, through the, the shortest and the easiest way. Uh, I think that jobs are not just the things that you pick in the air or pick in the space. So I think that they need to be a little bit patient and give government time to be able to get that which is going to be uh, uh, sustainable to them. Because it's not just an issue of having a job, but having a job that is going to be sustainable is much more important. So that way, I think that they should be a little bit patient and uh, give government time. And I think that if government promised to give them jobs, the government will likely do so. Except otherwise, then they could probably uh, in future complain about that. But uh, listening to you now, they will say that, they will be asking the question, for how long shall we continue to wait? And it is often said that the patient dog, uh, even though patience is a virtue, is an important uh, thing, uh, the patient dog ends up eating only the bones. And he may not even have the bones, it may not even have the bones if the inpatient dogs eat the flesh and the bones. Yes, I, you know, I also wish to say that this virtue of patience is very important. They will likely be given jobs, but I think that it's likely too early to think that they will not have, because there are other Cameroonians who have waited for years and they finally got jobs. So I think that in that area of job, I think they, sh they, they need to be a little bit patient. But again the government too should not be too slow because these people are also anxious to be able to be free so that they can serve the state in probably through those jobs so i think that uh, it's on two sides on both sides the government should uh, speed up uh, uh, its side and let the people also be patient and trust and believe that the government is going to do it because they have promised and i think that the government will likely fulfill its promise if they are patient, mm. I think so. Uh, this is happening uh, at the time when uh, the head of state, the minister of territorial administration, the governors of the two English-speaking regions, other authorities have repeatedly, have continuously said uh, uh, civilians carrying guns in the bushes, young people carrying the guns in the bushes, drop your guns, come out, we're going to receive you in the DDR centers, we'll reintegrate you into the normal life train, drop the guns so that peace can return, and at the same time those who are in the center who have already dropped their guns are protesting at this point in time. What could be the impact of this on uh, the cause? on the civilians who are carrying guns to drop the guns. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit difficult to advise government, but if I may wish to advise government, I think that they need to be very proactive. That is, speed up activities. Activities that are risky should not be kept sleeping. This is an issue that they have promised these young people. It needs to be done quickly so that these young people should be able to free themselves and be serving. Because it's, it's very unfair that you have promised people to drop their guns. They have dropped, they come. Then they are not treated properly. Then again, the issue of jobs is not forthcoming. I think that we, the government, needs to be very, very smart, proactive, and do things at the right time. Don't wait for things to deteriorate before you start reacting. So I think that it's, it's high time things should be done on time. 
Because at times, when we, we delay also, even though people need to be patient, people can run out of patience. And I think that is what is happening now. These people are anxious. They don't, I don't think that their desire is to stay into a camp. They wish to live their lives normally and, and be able to contribute to nation building. So I think that they cannot contribute to nation building when they are still there. So let the government also uh, speed up their promise and let these young people be actually freed and let them contribute to nation building. Because I think that the government wants to see them contribute to nation building. Mm -hmm. So it's on two sides, and I believe that the government will surely act speedily. Then I think they should not always wait for things to go off hand before they come in. Why not always do things on time so that you, you prevent such things from happening? Those who are still in the bushes, when they see this happening, when they see their former uh, friends who were with them in the bushes uh, protesting on the streets like this, what would be their state of mind? What impact would it have on... Uh, maybe some of them who are already thinking, contemplating, should I drop my gun and go out? No, you, you, it, it already has a negative impact because uh, uh, those who are there may be thinking that they too could be, will be treated the same way. So the government needs to be serious and do things the way that it will give positive results so that others who might be thinking of also dropping their guns, who we'll, we'll see it as a positive step. But if it becomes negative and pe these ones that have dropped are poorly treated, then it, it becomes a, a disincentive to the others. So I think that government, if they have engaged to do something, they should do it right to the end. And they should also take into consideration the fact that there are many more that would desire to be free. So the first set of people that they have taken should be an example so that it could be used even that this is a positive example, let others copy and follow suit so that this issue will likely come to an end. Mm. And the envoy of Pope Francis, his eminence, Cardinal Pietro Parolin said in Bamenda that for this conflict to come to an end, guns must go down. Yes, it's, 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 it's not him saying it in conflict resolution. I think it's obvious. Government needs to declare ceasefire so that it's on both sides. The government taking its responsibility and let the military truly operate professionally as the government claims that they're operating professionally, which people are still waiting to observe and to see and to confirm. And on the other hand, when ceasefire is declared, those in the bushes, clearly they already know that ceasefire has been declared. And that is where things of, 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 of dialogue and so on can come in. Because when ceasefire has not been declared, uh, everybody is probably still having a lot of doubt, skeptical, and fear is still in the minds of people. So let the government start, let the government take the first step, declare ceasefire, and say, from this day whatsoever, as it's supposed to be done legally by law. When ceasefire is, because I don't think that we should be saying things when we have not done, the, we've not taken the first step. Let the first step be taken. When ceasefire is declared, I think that people have been saying this, saying this, let the government declare ceasefire so that they will not be shooting people again, people will not be dying again. Then it sets a platform, it sets a basis for dialogue. When you now call dialogue, now people know that this is a, 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 a good start, a good step. Mm. So I think that that is what people are waiting. No, there, there is an issue with the uh, ceasefire, with the cause for ceasefire. The SDF, for example, precise during the visit of the, uh, made this precision during the visit of the Prime Minister to Bamenda, they said, the SDF said that there should be bilateral ceasefire. That is, ceasefire on both sides. The guns should go down. But government has a problem on one side of the issue. Government thinks that the pro-independence fighters should drop their guns, but the military normally have to carry their guns because they are uh, elements of the, 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 they are the legitimate carriers of guns and it is their duty to use the guns to protect the people and the territorial integrity of the country. No, before, before these issues, uh, 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 military was they were carrying their guns. It's obvious that military will always carry their guns. But when they talk of ceasefire in this situation, they are talking of shootings, killings, should stop and let 
the the process for dialogue take off they don't mean that the military will go and drop because even before this the military has been holding their guns we have been seeing the military with their guns everywhere but this ceasefire means that they will not be shootings again on both sides so when they talk of dropping guns here it doesn't mean that the military will go and drop their guns because the military that is their that, that is what they have been trained for they have been holding their guns we have been seeing it even in time past the guns belong to them but this 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 declaration of ceasefire will make them to understand that shooting should stop operation clean bamenda shooting should, should stop. be put at, to an end operation clean bamenda the manhunt uh, hunt for separatist fighters in the bushes should come to an end is that what you're saying no i think that we should at times there are some people who make some type of statements like operation clean by whatsoever those type of statements we don't count on those type of statements we count on positive statements not negative statements so what is more important i believe in cameroon now is for ceasefire to be declared government is the one to do that when that is done it sets a precedent it sets a platform it sets a basis for dialogue to begin because dialogue cannot begin when people are still shooting when the guns are still so strong in the hands of the separatists. Now, what do you think about mediation? The bishops of the Cameroon of the National Episcopal Conference, speaking to the envoy of the Pope uh, recently in Yaoundé, complained that uh, they are not being heard by the presidency of the Republic. They have written a letter there to today. They have no response. And they were writing a letter in the perspective of mediating in the dialogue, in the crisis, to, in view of bringing an end to the crisis. Yeah, mediation is important, but we know that mediation is only possible when both parties agree, because you cannot mediate if one of the parties say no. And I think that the strongest party in this situation is the government. If the government wish that mediation should be done, I still wish to say again that the first step is ceasefire. Let there be ceasefire. Then mediation can come in. And let me also say that mediation is complex probably in a situation like this government may not be seeing any need for mediation because they assume that the people who are in the bushes are called otherwise they don't see them as people who are fighting for their rights they see them as terrorists as they have been called and whatsoever so you see it's a bit complex it's a bit difficult and i believe that it's high time for government to put a human face a human face in the situation like this where so many people have died and it's high time to be humane in a situation like this it's high time to actually put a human face let the cry of the people be heard and the possible solutions be, 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 be put in place if it needs to take mediation fine if you need to take other methods that is going to solve and resolve and bring this problem to an end let it be used all right, let, let's extend to the continent. Uh, we are rounding up already. You are the chairman of Excellence Union International Group, and one of the uh, areas of concern of this organization is taking Africa out of the precarious condition, the precarious situation in which it finds itself now with poverty and underdevelopment afflicting several parts of the continent. Where is the way out of the situation? Where is the solution? Africa is not a poor continent. Africa is the richest continent in the world. And I want Africans to know this. Africa is not a poor continent. Africans have a poverty mentality. But the continent Africa is the richest. It is rich in, in natural resources. God blessed Africa with a lot of resources in all the spheres. So Africa is not a poor continent. If Africans wish to think that they are poor, fine. What I believe is that Africans need to sit up. And this is what Excellence Union International Group is propagating. Africans must sit up and take the destiny of their continent in their hands. Nobody is going to wipe, eradicate, or fight against poverty for Africans. Their minds are in foreign nations. Their minds are in foreign aid. But they have more than foreign aid. They have godly aid that have been given to Africans in Africa. I don't think that Africans should, should remain in their phony situations that they are poor. They are not poor. There is no poverty in Africa. Africans have chosen to think that they are poor. They are not. Let them use the resources that they have 
they have been blessed with. They have intellectuals worldwide. What I may propose is that let there be a united force of African intellectuals worldwide and let them sit down and draw a strategic plan for the development of Africa. Africa should not cry again. They have refused to use that which God has given them to develop their continent. But others are using it to develop their own continent. It's a contradiction. And I believe that Africans are able to do it. Let them sit up and change the way they think, change their mindset, and take the bull by the horn and develop their continent. Nobody is going to do it for them. They should do it by themselves. Let them come together, right. Africans all we'll, over the world. We'll they certain, are able to do it. We'll certainly talk about this in greater details in the subsequent editions of the news on Ekinox Television. Thanks so much, Musoke Lucas Leonga, civil society leader, development expert, chairman of Excellence Union International Group. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. I think that Equinox is a good place and will always be ready to to say to respond positively to your invitations. Thank you very much for inviting us. Thank you for staying with us, ladies and gentlemen. Equinox is coming up next.